Um, I'd like to welcome you all to today's live webinar where we're going to be looking at the power of connection and community in this time of social distancing. My name is Sarah Murphy and I'm Managing Director of Business Post iQuest. We are a part of Business Post group of companies headquartered here in Dublin and I specifically run the events arm of the group. Uh, we're also involved with Irish Hospitality Global, a global network of Irish pubs and restaurants around the world and also some trade publications which fit within the B2B side of the business. I've also sit on the board of BIT Ireland and I've had the privilege to be involved with the organisation for quite a few years. Um, so before we start into some discussion, I'd like to invite the president of BITA, Paul Whitnell, to briefly explain a bit about the organisation and how it's adapting to the current situation. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I suppose the first question that anybody would ask is, um, how does a network organisation network uh, during these times when we're not about, out and about? And I suppose the answer to that is our, our network is not only about events. Uh, it's very much about relationship and community and knowing people that know people that help people, which um, is, is what we do. Um, so in, in order to do that, we have had, had to do it, adapt um, and, and do so very quickly. So I suppose uh, we learned an awful lot about leadership um, in, in that regard, doing that. Uh, we created an online platform, um, which we're on, um, to, to display how we can now connect with people uh, in the new world as such and, and discuss various topics. Um, we, we did so and we stuck to the relativity, I suppose, um, at the moment in terms of crisis management and dealing with uh, things like furlough and how people can ask, access business loans and stuff like that, you know. So it was very important in terms of how we go through this uh, transition um, and we, we, we were mindful of our members, we're mindful of brand, we're mindful of things uh, that are changing in a challenging world. Uh, but what we have done is we have adapted quite well. Uh, we have now quite a system set up where we can actually communicate very well among our membership. Um, and while doing so, then we're improving things like CRM systems, which is the data that's available about various members. So from a bit of perspective, um, BITA is alive and well. Um, and, and there to serve you, the member, and, and anybody who wants to join the organisation. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, that's great. As I said, I've been involved with BIDA for many years, and it's a great organisation and has helped me build huge networks across the UK, and then when I moved back to Ireland subsequently also. So, Okay, so I'm joined today by uh, three guests. So we've Shane Dempsey, who is Director of Communications and Government Relations at the Construction Industry Federation of Ireland. We have Enda O'Conine, who is Group CEO and Publisher of the Business Post Group, and Dee Laffin, who is Publishing Director of FFT Magazine, which is a digital and print publication in the hospitality sector. So before we kind of maybe get into the community side of the conversation, I think it'd be great to hear from each of you just briefly on the business or industry that you that you operate in and just for a short summary for maybe anyone who isn't quite au fait with it. So Shane, I don't know if you want to kick off there. Yeah, thanks, Sarah, and hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm Director of Communications with the Construction Industry Federation. So we're the representative body for uh, construction companies in Ireland. Um, that involves everything from lobbying to advising members on issues like IR, HR, um, and obviously laterally on the COVID uh, pandemic. And it's been a roller coaster, as it always is in the construction industry, but it's been a really st a stark roller coaster in the last few weeks in terms of uh, the industry being shut down and our efforts to reopen it. So uh, that's a, a, a synopsis of the last couple of weeks. Great, thanks Shane. Uh, Dee, do you want to jump in there and tell us a little bit about FFT? Yeah, sure. So um, FFT or Food for Thought um, magazine is a publication um, that I started with um, at the beginning of the year. Um, we rebranded the publication, um, first of all, for our first print edition of the year this year. Um, it's Ireland's premier hospitality title. So the publication's actually been going 10 years. Um, and it's really, I suppose, a, a centerpiece for the industry in terms of a platform that they can use to get content out, get word out, speak to us about um, uh, what's happening in the industry, whether it's food service, restaurants, chefs, um, or any type of the hospitality industry from hotels to pubs, everything. We're connecting all of those industries together and through our website um, at the moment, which we've never seen so much traffic on, I suppose, because everybody's on all at home. Um, we've had a great readership and had a lot of people contact us and connect with us and really trying to get 
ask us questions about what's happening on the latest kind of regulations and guidelines if they're trying to run their business. Um, so we're really, I suppose, at the heart of all of that, um, of that industry. And we try and be a spokesperson for those people um, constantly trying to profile businesses, profile producers, initiatives, things like that. And we've certainly seen a lot of that in the last few weeks. The hospitality industry, unfortunately, is an industry that suffered significantly like others because of COVID. Um, it's a very, very uncertain future for it as an industry for a lot of people within it. So we're trying to, I suppose, streamline that information. There's a lot of information coming from a lot of different sources. So we're trying to streamline it and put out some facts, answer questions, and just try and be as relevant as possible right now. And I suppose our weekly newsletter is how people can really digest that information on a daily basis and stay in touch with us. So that's great. It. Thanks very much. And Enda, tell us a bit about the Business Post group. Um, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I was chatting with Paul. Uh, people are getting so bored of COVID now, we can talk about Brexit again for a while. <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, you know, it's, it's a road crash uh, for our business. Uh, we're involved in uh, business services, uh, uh, events uh, and exhibitions and media. Uh, but our flagship brand is the Business Post, which is a Sunday publication, but we've reinvented it as a 24-7 as a uh, digital platform that has print. Um, so community, the theme is, is ever, ever more important because we have to work, particularly in these times, we, we've had to take a, a team of 70 people and within a, a few days work from home and, and continue our work. And that has been very, very challenging. So I think what we have to do is, uh, for us, I see it as, as a major challenge, but also as a very major opportunity because it's accelerating what we know is happening anyhow, you know, uh, and 5G is revolutionizing communications. So, you know, be it in the construction sector, uh, we had planned a physical conference, but it's now going to be a, a digital emphasis on that. Uh, in our own, there's a whole, we've sort of banned the term webinar, I think, and we're having meetings and they just have to be virtually. So from the publication perspective, it's accelerating what we need to do anyhow. So, um, I, and I think that's true of a lot of business, mm -hmm. uh, with the exception perhaps of restaurants, because, you know, it's part of that experience going out to eat, but a lot of the rest of the economy. So what we've had to do is we've had to pay extra attention to how we communicate. Uh, I think after a while people go working remotely, there's about 50% of the people who respond well to it. So I think as, as a, to solve that, what you have to do is you have to create more training online. You have to create reasons to bring people together as a community. Uh, and what you just don't maybe have a webinar for the sake of us all being together as a company. You create learnings uh, working remotely and there are a lot of uh, challenges uh, to working remotely. Uh, in my own particular case, I spent two months on my own in the Southern Ocean. So for me, it's been a very a quick adoption, but for a lot of people, it is very challenging and the, the mental health psychology i think as managers as employers we have to pay extra attention to that so the way we do it is is make that extra effort not just at a general level but filtering down to talk to people on an individual basis they may seem okay but you you have to reach out you have to pay that extra special effort so if that's a learning it reinforces community even stronger and the sort of community built in Bitta and the british irish trade alliance uh, we're increasingly defined by communities, if you like. And in our own business, um, it's tough, uh, but, you know, we have to adapt. And that's just, you know, Darwin at work again. We will mm -hmm. find solutions. We will come through it. Yeah, no, no, that's true. And, and I think that's what we're saying. The world as we know it has changed essentially overnight when that first uh, case was confirmed two months ago. And we have to adapt our models, our structures about get through this period of crisis that we're in now, but also to look at how our businesses will navigate what the new reality is going to be and, and try and look at it as an opportunity as opposed to a, or 
you look at the reality, but also as, as an opportunity of it. So there's obviously a huge amount of coverage and conversation around the government supports that are out there and um, working capital schemes, stimulus packages, et cetera, and how we'll open up the economy. But for today, I think I wanted to focus on is how businesses have already and can further cultivate and foster maybe a sense of community and connection for their clients, staff, stakeholders, and the industry that they operate in um, during this period and how they can benefit from that. Um, I think one of the biggest things we've seen um, from a human aspect during this is the generosity of spirit that's present all across the country. We're seeing a lot of it on social media, online, on the news. And I think you see people wanting to feel that they belong as part of something. And um, whether that's both professionally and personally, I think this crisis has shown people that. And uh, maybe what's important in some ways and belonging is, is a big thing, I think, and that. And that's both in, in their professional and personal lives. So I think I wanted to kind of us just to discuss maybe some of the points, some things we've seen within our organizations, our industries, and some takeaway points for people as to how they can build those communities and connections. Um, for example, from a Business Post iQuest perspective, we normally organize in excess of 30 live events a year, a mixture of conferences, exhibitions, awards, corporate events. And now we're facing a moratorium on events at the moment of any gatherings of anyone outside your immediate household. So, you know, we kind of look at how, how do we cope with that? Um, how do we, yeah, do we innovate, we adapt, we look to change our business model um, to hold live events, to develop a circle club, which we're in the prospect, uh, process of doing, which is bringing together corporates um, for virtual events. We did our first breakfast event last week that was virtual. We had eight CEOs from some of the biggest Irish companies around a virtual breakfast table and you know we had uh Rowley's breakfast was delivered to, to some of them who are in the in the vicinity and uh we had an engaging conversation with some of the editors from the business post and um wanted to hear about how their business are adapting to this but also life in general and the setting the scene and how they see for going things for going forward and um and then next week we're holding a virtual wine tasting next thursday evening uh, where we have a wine connoisseur coming on and you know it's it's it all sounds a little bit you know, quirky and out there, but for us, it's how do we keep those corporate communities engaged? How do we build a sense of connection? How do we bring them around the table to talk about stuff that they're interested in? How we as businesses can kind of make a difference in this time. So that's a little bit of, you know, one of the, one level of what we were doing. And then obviously we're working with the CIF um, to, to put on some of their events. And we have the digital construct, CIF digital construction so much, which was due to take place in, start of July and that's obviously although restrictions might be eased a bit I don't think we're in any under any illusion that we'd be holding a live event for 200 people the first week of July so we've decided to make that a virtual summit so we're working with Shane and and his team there to fully move that online it's going to be a you know a full day conference essentially but we really we're looking at you know big technology we're looking at how we engage people to attend we're looking at how we can you know our traditional partners and sponsors how can they meet people online that they would normally do over the coffee table at one of these events. How do we connect and how can technology help us to do that? And again, it's building a virtual community. Um, so I suppose I'd be interested to maybe speak it. And Shane, have you got your hand up? Or do you... uh, yeah, 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 I can, I can come in. Yeah. It's just it's there's many ironies with the uh, pandemic. Um, one of them, when I think back before the pandemic, we were lamenting the use of social media and digital communications and it was atomizing our communities and it was the end of civilization as we know it and the reality is without digital technologies and the type of virtual webinars conferences whatever you call them now there would be no community so so that i mean that's one major irony the other irony which really rails against everything we've come to believe ourselves to be in the last couple of years is that community as we know it now can be harmful to you so like physically meeting etc cetera, etc cetera, can be harmful so there's been a real mind shift in six weeks and the speed of that shift has been incredible like I had the fortune of uh, completing a master's in Smurfit recently on organizational change and any kind of, of any of the literature uh, would dictate or would say that it takes you know two years to bring about a change process uh, through an organization and then a year or two to bed it down before it disintegrates again and we all revert back to where we were but uh, like in six weeks organizations have fundamentally changed the mindset has changed um, and, and organizations are going to shift very quickly it just shows how innovative people are 
um, and, and already have mentioned some of the some of the um, uh, changes people have made to cope with this. And I think some of these measures will stay in place and should stay in place uh, after the pandemic has has passed and it will pass. Um, so 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 that's the new environment we're facing. And so how do you build your community? The the thing that struck me. Um, uh, over the last while is that the community has always been there um, and the pandemic has really brought it to the fore. So like when you look at metrics now, you, anyone who's looking at metrics on websites, LinkedIn, uh, uh, even physical inquiries into organizations, they'll notice a huge increase. So our daily traffic on our website used to be less than a thousand. It topped 110,000 two days ago. Um, like, Every, everything is nearly collapsing now. We're particularly, uh, uh, we're an industry that's front and center in the in the in the pandemic. You know, there's huge interest in whether we'll reopen again. We have 150,000 people in in the industry who are all seeking to information about their industry and when they can go back to work. So, so organisations need to really understand that they're going to be getting a huge amount of. Uh, contact from potential community members uh, over the next couple of months through digital channels and you have to have vehicles and avenues created to produce them so my colleague uh, was putting on a webinar about an indu an induction program that the CIF has has put in place and he allowed he allowed for 50 members to attend um, there was about 70,000 people uh, trying to get onto the website to, to, to do the induction program and watch the webinar. So it's just the scale of what we're dealing with yeah. here, the scale of the potential community you have now is beyond anything you've thought of before. And you, you, you really need to realign your, your channels to be able to even absorb that somehow. So that's one key insight from, from the pandemic for us anyway. Yeah, absolutely, Shane. I think, you know, you have to be slick and you have to be concise with your communications around it because um, people are getting so much virtual communication from people. Um, we just have a couple of questions actually coming in there we might address as, as we go. Um, Vince asked, do you think this will become the norm in the future, uh, virtual conferences? And just for me to come back to that, and maybe some other people might as well. I certainly think for the time being, we have to adapt our business model uh, to deal with that. Um, and I think we're, we're launching a whole series now over the summer of virtual conferences that weren't in existence before this happens. So it's an opportunity there. And then for us, I think we are going to have to increase our digital offering around our live events once we're back up and running. And I think that's been a big learning for us that, yeah, we had some interaction from a digital level at our events, but our entire events weren't available to stream virtually ahead of this and they are going to be after this because I hope we hope we'll be back with some events of some description in Q4 of this year that's maybe that's optimistic but that's what we're aiming for at the moment with social distancing in place and if that happens we may have half the number of delegates or less but we hope that we'll have a huge amount more from a global perspective buying their tickets to tune in virtually and see the entire conference from a virtual perspective and um, so that's that's that um we also, Enda, I've got a question for you from uh, Paul here, Paul Edmonds. Due to the issue of fake news, trust in the media is in decline. How are you approaching this challenge? Um, yes, I think it was Donald Trump who termed the phrase fake news and he was the biggest uh, retailer of it himself. Uh, from our perspective, it's strengthened. People have realized the difference between something that goes up as a post on Facebook or WhatsApp. Um, it's actually strengthened our brand and uh, it's, it's fundamentally good. Our digital subscriptions are up and our physical copies are up. So from our perspective, it's good because we employ professional journalism. We've upped the journalism. That's somebody who checks the facts of what's written. So I, I think penultimately it's reestablishing trust in brands. And I'm not just saying in our own news brands, I think in brands generally, there's a reversion back uh, so brands will come through. So from our viewpoint, um, it's, it's an accelerating what we've believed anyhow. And uh, Trump himself, uh, you know, he, he's a bit simple. How, how he came on the fake news journey, he'd see something on Facebook or Twitter and he knew it was false. So he'd call it fake news. He didn't read really newspapers. He just watched Fox TV. He didn't actually distinguish between a news organization that filters, that checks the facts, that have 
professionally trained people to read through agendas. So uh, for us, it's actually a real positive. Uh, it, it restores the value of our core value proposition. But on the other end, trust, because people now at grassroots level, trust is coming from the bottom up. It's coming from transparencies because people at the top and civil servants and the trust in government is, 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 is reinforced at the moment because of the COVID thing. But generally, it's a downward trust. But, but, but in answer fundamentally to the question, for us, it's, 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 it's good. Uh, it, it's strengthened our brand and it's strengthened our business. And it's what's keeping us alive, frankly, because other aspects of the business are under serious threat. Uh, you know, such as events and such as uh, services. But I, I'll finish just to change the subject slightly. Uh, Sarah was talking about, uh, you know, the, the breakfasts and the, the virtual wine tasting, sending bottles of wine around people's houses. Even though you may not be doing business with people, I think this is an opportunity to reach out mm -hmm. and look on your customers as a community and call them and talk to them, even though you're not looking for something or you're not looking to supply something. This is a real opportunity to be authentic and to care, uh, not just because you want people's business, of course you do, but to actually reach out. And I think there's a, there's a very fundamental uh, message in that. And I keep coming back uh, to that there is an opportunity uh, for you to, to reinforce your brand and your business and how authentic you are. Yeah. Yeah, no, agreed. Um, Dee, would tell us a little bit maybe about the hospitality industry and some of the initiatives and the community yeah. thing we've seen there during what's a basically a very difficult time over the last few weeks. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's um, the I suppose the the food family or community in Ireland has always been quite close knit, but I think it's never been more so in the last kind of few months. Um, a lot of restaurants made their own decision to close. Uh, before it was announced by the government, um, just due to their the safety of their own staff, thinking about their own team, their own families themselves, um, and then their customers, obviously, and making sure that they could uh, they would reopen when it was safe to do so. Um, that initially meant that um, every restaurant, and and when the government initiated that as well, that you know just every restaurant and and cafe and everything food provider closed and. Um, I think there was a lot of uncertainty um, in terms of the future and unfortunately led to a huge amount of, of um, employment losses. Um, and I think a lot of, a lot of restaurants run on, on very tight margins as it is. And I think having to pay rent while not having any money coming in, you know, th there was insurance concerns um, rates from council, um, even things after speaking with a client of ours, um, you know, things like the airway systems and um, just loads of different kind of systems within the restaurant that they would have to think about um, really started to, the cost started to, to rack up against that. And I guess there was huge, huge amount of uncertainty. Um, there was, but what's happened is the kind of, everybody has started to I think help everybody else out first of all um a lot of chefs went straight online went onto their social media accounts or created social media accounts if they didn't have them and started to share recipes from their restaurants started to um just speak out about what they were going through about how you know how many staff they had to let go about how devastating it was for them um how hard it is for you know the smaller more independent restaurants they really kind of spoke out about the uncertainty of everything and that really brought everybody together I suppose in a crisis as it does um, the stories that came out were initially quite shocking um, but then I suppose over time as restrictions have changed um, there any restaurant now or cafe that can is open for takeaway um, some are able to offer delivery service others are doing collections what I've seen doing the rounds is a lot of safety guidelines being shared within the community. Um, people coming to us looking for those. I've passed them on to loads of people um, the, from the World Health Organization, but also from, from the Irish uh, Health Service as well, the HSC, um, and through the Restaurant Association of Ireland, which um, we're the official publication for. We've kind of been trying to spread their um, 
their guidelines as they're getting it and they're dealing with the government a lot more on the front line. Um, but some amazing initiatives that have come out, I suppose, is kind of chefs and restaurants who are going above and beyond. Um, there are a lot of restaurants feeding frontline workers, um, taking it, like for example, I'm sure a restaurant in County Kildare who went straight in with two Michelin stars after I think six or seven months of being opening last year, which was a huge and positive uh, story for Ireland last year. Um, uh, Jordan Bailey is head chef there. His wife, Mikan, is um, front of house. She's the restaurant manager. And they decided, even though they can't open up the restaurant, they can't do takeaways, they decided to feed uh, the, the staff in NACE General Hospital, which is the closest hospital to them. So they send meals that are ready made into the hospital and they just have to be reheated mm -hmm. um, just to try and do something. And they're using, um, they're harvesting things that are growing in the garden that would have been spoiled otherwise. So it's kind of helping with waste for them. They're also getting donations from suppliers um, of ingredients and they're able to make meals from that. Um, I've seen other initiatives where people are donating money to restaurants or chefs who are cooking for, again, for frontline workers um, and for homeless and for those kind of initiatives as well. Um, there have been a lot of restaurants are doing market boxes or, you know, actual ingredient boxes. Um, I know that Ruben in, in Galway, um, they're doing market boxes with producers that they would use in their dishes. They're kind of putting boxes together with vegetables and everything, as well as local products and their own products like preserves or ferments or things that people can buy. So they're in a more rural area. So people can kind of get to somewhere that they can get good food and good ingredients. Um, but there's in a massive sense of community, people just helping where they can um, supplying. Initially, there was a, a lot of issues with restaurants getting ingredients because unfortunately, some distributors and suppliers went out of business um, because they were, you know, too hurt from the fallout initially of COVID, but then others who just finding it difficult to get the ingredients and get back up and running again. But that's all um, through chefs kind of sharing and, and, and helping to kind of share contact details or suppliers ingredients or things like that they've really shared that around so there's really been a massive sense of community there as well yeah. um and i've also seen a lot of people just you know even the business post and um food and wine and ourselves you know sharing just lists of where you can get food where you can get supplies where you can get deliveries and connecting people in their local areas i know food and wine are running an initiative on the site called Shop for Ireland, where they highlight initiatives that they really believe in. Um, we're kind of running a campaign at the moment with Unilever called Stronger Together, which is highlighting the hospitality heroes um, in, in a campaign where the industry can actually nominate people who are working within the industry and doing something that's going above and beyond. And we've had some really amazing nominations for that. Um, and that's just really highlighting them um, to everybody and let everyone know what's happening around the country, you know, from every corner of the island. Um, and we're also through that campaign, we're putting out pieces of content with Unilever that are kind of, you know, we gave advice to restaurants on how to kind of run takeaway, which actually loads of people got in contact with us and asked us to share the link with them and spread and, and you know, people who had missed it the first time around. Um, and just kind of a lot of, I suppose, looking for information. And I think that's the main thing that we found from ourselves is, as Endo was even saying, it's just people are going back to sources of, of media and information that they trust. And we found that it's actually been really positive for us. Um, and again, uh, um, as Shane was saying, we've seen a massive increase in numbers to the site um, because people are really looking for that information and they want to connect right now. Yeah. No, that's great. And I think that sense of community will stand to organisations when, when this passes and who has been involved in their community and who hasn't. And I think that's one of the key takeaways. Shane, we have a question there for you, just asking, so how is the CIF helping the industry to prepare for the return to sites while maintaining health and safety? Uh, you froze there on me. Oh, sorry. sorry. Um, but, 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 but then the question came in about three seconds really quickly. So you yeah, asked me, you look like you're on fast forward. You asked me, what are we doing uh, to help members through the process, the oh, pandemic? Is return it? while maintaining health and safety. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, it, it actually relates to 
um, something um, both Enda, uh, Enda and Dee has mentioned there. In situations like this, you, ha you have to become a touch point for your community where they can go for, you know, reliable information. So, I mean, you have to stand out like a beacon and you have to be, I suppose, to try as much as you can to, to be that light, you know, shining, shining a direction for, for people. So like, for your members and for your community. And like what we did at the very outset um, was we met as a, an executive team and we agreed that people would be coming to us for info and we would never go beyond what the HSE and the government um, uh, dictated in terms of the, the measures and the restrictions. Um, but we will give as much information as, as, as possible. Um, and we have many dimensions, I suppose, when you're creating your message that, that you're putting out to your community and you're trying to be that source of info, you have to recognize that they're just normal people. They're afraid. There are legal implications to what you're going to be saying. There are contractual implications. There are, you know, uh, risks that if you say the wrong thing, someone might behave in the wrong way and in, in a pandemic situation, it may result in sickness and, you know, worse. So, so you have to put a huge amount of thought into the message uh, that goes out there. Once it's agreed from all of those dimensions, and this is where the team is so important, like the person who you might normally get on with is exactly the person you want reviewing what the message is because they're going to point out something that you don't think about. So it's really important to craft that message carefully. And then where you can... Uh, you try and provide a, a regular source of communication to, to kind of establish ourselves as the touch point. We created a standard operating procedure and this is where our immediate community of members came, became so useful. We, talk, we had about 50 members and people from um, our European Federation also uh, working together over, you know, intensively over three or four days to create what's now considered the gold-plated standard operating procedure for going back to work in construction safely. Um, and we really utilized our membership network there. But we made that information um, freely available to, to anybody, you know, but particularly, obviously, people in the industry and people who weren't members of the CIF. So, so yes, there's, a, there's an ask there. There's a look at our expert information, come and join our network. But it's also helpful for the network and the industry to have access to that information and have access to our community. So I suppose in the pandemic, the general message is you protect your IP, you protect your information, you protect your, your unique selling point. But in, a, in, a, in this type of situation, there's a bigger payoff in terms of community and making some of your information uh, open source. And it actually helps with the whole situation. So, so that's been a key thing we've tried to do. Then there are, there are small little things like when you're trying to craft the message I mentioned earlier on that considers the legal implications and the health implications and contractual implications, you can have a very um, camel-like statement that actually doesn't communicate anything and alienates your community. So where you can try and align your message beside a face, like try and make someone the face of your organization, the face of your community, um, and make sure that you're writing and in, and in your messaging, it's understandable. It's spoken word where possible. So we've been sending out daily, daily emails to members. Sometimes when there's no new information, it's just a couple of lines hoping they're okay you know, hoping they're okay and asking them, you know, to provide any feedback, just just to keep the connection going there. And you may have to reference some very technical documents. Um, uh, and we've been discussing some of the technicalities around this and the legal requirements, but you can always introduce them with a single line that makes complete sense to, to anybody so they can decide whether they read it or not. So just basic small little things like that. Of course, the use of video, we're all vi very video conscious now. Um, we all worry about our backgrounds and how we're <laughs> dressed and no one sees the bottom half, so we won't ask about that. Like, but, <laughs> but, but, but really, vid video is very, very powerful. Yeah. Um, um, and where possible, you put a face on this because um, because you can't build a community without people. Paul will say that you know, and and if if the messages coming out of your organisation aren't, if a person doesn't read your 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 email, say like visualising someone, even if they don't know you, then you're kind of lost. So so there are just a few things we we've picked up. Uh, but the key thing is uh, have a document or have 
some knowledge that that people have to come to your organization for and then work with them thereafter you know yeah um, Shane, a couple of questions have come in for you. We won't go through them all, but one: um, what impact does CIF think you will have um, on property values, both short and long term? Any quick update <laughs> there from a Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd love to know if the person who asked that question is buying or selling property. <laughs> <laughs> then I know how to give them the answer they want to hear. Uh, I, I, you can't. You, well, I've seen. I'm looking for a place Alex, myself. Alex, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the certainly the property values have have taken an awful dip. Uh, so house values have taken an awful dip in the in the last couple of weeks, and I don't see that uh, I don't see that going any other direction in the in the in the immediate term. But we have a very dysfunctional housing uh, market, as we all know, and uh, when we emerge from this pandemic, we we'll still need houses. Uh, we need more houses than we did before the pandemic started and we'll have built less. So talking to my colleague uh, in the housing sector today, uh, we were aiming for 20, I think it was 22,000, 23,000 houses by the end of the year. Um, he, and he, he's not prone to exaggeration. He thinks it might be around 14,000 um, by the end of the year because we've lost such a a period and it takes so long to start this and commence a house and complete a house so um we might see we might see the dip coming at the in the second or the first half of next year when we we reach a kind of a, an equilibrium again but so that would imply that house prices will rise um due to scarcity in the second half of the year if we get through the pandemic relatively quickly um there's, there's people out there like everything else. Uh, some people are greedy when everyone is fearful and some people are fearful when everyone is greedy. And there, there will be people out there purchasing houses in the second half of the year, um, but supply will be very, very tight. So you can imagine there'll be price increases um, uh, uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the year. Okay, thanks Shane. I think one maybe for Enda here, um, a question, <laughs> do we think the different attitudes of the British and Irish governments to this will make trade more complicated? Off the back of this, I think you're muted there, and we might need to. Yes, I think it's going to be phenomenally challenging because we we have this road crash of Brexit coming up, and uh, we're at a different level and at a different speed. Um, I had been involved myself. What I saw in Ireland was we have about ten very significant trade groups, and they all have their own proposals, their own agendas in terms of getting out of the downturn. And similarly in the UK, uh, there are many, many different groups. So government initiatives are very, very fragmented. And um, I have been involved in a project um, working with John Morn, who is the former Secretary General of the Department of Finance. And with great success, we've brought together um, small firms association, restaurants association, small and medium enterprises association. So we're creating a national and we're presenting, we're going to launch that next week. That's initiative, an initiative in the business post, we see initiatives coming in from a lot of different directions. But in the UK and Ireland context, um, you know, countries have been withdrawing into themselves. Nationalism is becoming stronger. So we're going to have to work ever harder. And I think that's why our Bitta and several similar organizations can play a role. It's going to be really, really challenging. And uh, because we're not having the physical contact, we're not having the physical communication. That was the success of the European Union. It wasn't so much the formal structures. It was the offline conversations that built up tremendous, deep, respectful and understanding relations. And now all of that is going by the wayside. That combined with COVID, I think it's going to be really, really challenging. And people, when you don't have that offline conversation like you get over the coffee machine or over uh, in office informally, and we're not having those informal chats. And uh, so I, in answer to the question, I, I think it's going to be really, really challenging. Uh, so we have to be ever more cognizant of it and we have to try harder to see around corners. And we will come through it, I have no doubt about it, because it's going to... It's going to be a time for disruptors. It's going to be a time for people to come in with new ways of doing things. So I'm, I'm frankly very excited because 
the stuff I've kind of wanted to do at our business for a while. And this is now giving the roadway to do it. It's all subject to resource, of course, you need the money coming in. So I don't have any answer on magic formula, except the first step is to know what we don't know and to be totally aware that there are going to be big issues there that will come. People start fighting with each other uh, because they are not having these offline communications and even this video type communication is better than nothing. We yeah. do have to make that extra greater effort. Yeah. Um, one or two last questions then before, before we wrap up. Brendan Trumi asked, do you agree that most, given most of your teams are furloughed, that this is the best time to do virtual training and discuss issues within the business that when you're busy, you do not find the time to do? I don't know if anyone wants to give any input on that. I know from, from our perspective, we certainly think it is a time to be looking to upskill. We're looking to see what skills we have that we can put out to people as well to offer to our clients and to our, our industry. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I would agree with that. I don't know if anyone else has any, any thoughts on this in terms of using it as a time for learning. No one's going to jump in. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've noticed um, we've fairly significant training department, learning and development department in the CIF. We've, we've gone virtual, we're online now. Most training programs are delivered through a virtual academy and uh, revenues, if you want to measure it that way, are, are stronger than previously. So I think it is, it's a huge opportunity for people who are furloughed to, to train. Yeah. Like it's a short term, sorry, I, I, could, I have a, a horrible image of myself get saying that this will be over quickly and that being played back to me on video in a couple of, a couple of months <laughs> but <laughs> the first wave of this pandemic will be short term i think it won't go on too long um and every you should be thinking into the medium term in your business as much as if yeah. if possible uh, and including including your staff obviously you know they're going to carry you through this in the latter half of the year so look hold on to your staff as close as you can keep your internal community going as, yeah. as strongly as you can give them whatever support you can there's webinars on mental health there's everything you know and they're all free and d has alluded to them everyone is really pulling together to get through this and uh, uh, i think you should, we should all use the opportunity i think yeah. also just to hop in there sarah just to add to that is that um I think a lot of in the hospitality industry, there's definitely a lot of people thinking about their futures and thinking about um, how they can add skills to their to their already to their CV in terms of, you know, with the, the mm -hmm. pubs closed for looking like a, a bit longer um, than the restaurants, you know, some people looking to enter different sectors of the industry until they can return back to their jobs. So there are a lot of I think a lot of people looking at taking on new skills um, from that perspective. But also, I think it's been a massive learning curve for a lot of people, for restaurateurs, for chefs, for hoteliers, for everybody. Um, you know, there's a restaurant in Sandy, in Sandy Mount, Bujo, which has, um, you know, gone from being a restaurant to one of the biggest deliver, deliverers of um, burger home kits to, I think it's over four or five counties now. They've scaled up so quickly, but they've gone from, you know, like running a restaurant to now running a delivery service. I spoke with a restaurateur and head chef of Hang Dai the other evening. I interviewed him and just about, they're looking at learning how to change um, their restaurant from they serve Chinese cuisine from high-end Chinese cuisine to being a kind of a hub of music and entertainment and fun and eating to basically a Chinese takeaway. And that kind of mental, um, I suppose, uh, you know, realization that your whole business model has changed, mm -hmm. um, how to change the space you're working in, how to change your waiters are now, um, that they, you know, floor set that they had within the restaurant are now working in the kitchen to help get takeaways and deliveries out. So people are having, the staff are having to change their skill set and learn so quickly. Um, other chefs trying different types of drive-throughs and takeaways and collections and learning from that. Um, I think that I've now seen three or four different versions of takeaways and collections and stuff like that. And everybody's learning from everyone. So there's a lot of different skills being learned um, from that perspective, I think as well, you know, the learning curve has been massive. People have adapted and they've adapted well. And 
I think people should give themselves credit for that as well without you know having to go out and learn new skills they they should look at how well they're doing if they're managing to keep their business going during this and adapting to every every change and every restriction that's lifted I think it's it's commendable yeah no absolutely Paul a question there just how is business securing its future without the opportunity for live events well I think I mean you, you've touched on a lot of points that are very important here and I think community in itself you know is is a very valid point in terms of how we communicate so we have the difficulty uh, in terms of what we're, we're facing to collectively but what can be very useful is if we look at beta as a model in terms of the chapters are spread from Scotland to Wales to London to the Isle of Man Ireland uh, America and Australia and with that, there's different ways to actually adapt. There's different ways to go through these, uh, the, the challenges we're faced. And the learning that takes place uh, within those areas uh, can be varied as well. We as an organization have adapted very quickly to provide a platform to communicate these learnings. You know, for instance, I had this morning uh, a, a great discussion with a company called, uh, called Vcode. And what they're all about is um, they're all about the safe access to to large stadiums and, and um, you know, and we said, you know, the, the adaptation of this product could be uh, brought into sites. So then it's about communication and community and solidarity. Um, and, and, you know, it, that now we have the ability to talk to Shane and other organizations like CIF in terms of what we've learned over here in this market, you know, because markets are different, demographics are different. And when you're dealing with a situation like this, you know, there's a very different way to deal with a situation for a 4 million um, you know, population or 5 million population than there is to a 60 million population. And indeed, when you talk about the Isle of Man, you know, there's great learnings in a small little area as well. So what you can do when you're collaborating and when you're communicating very well is you can find out solutions that are actually in front of us, but we actually don't quite see them yet. So, you know, we as an organization see that relativity uh, as ours. Uh, you know, we are um, an immense communicator um, we are proud of the collaborations that we do get involved in and we position ourselves as that beacon in terms of communicating and finding what a, people know in, in, in relevant areas. Yeah, no, that's great. And I suppose we even see the opportunities from our side in the CIF Digicon. We're now expecting, you know, hundreds of attendees to come in from all over the world who wouldn't necessarily have traveled for it. And it's, it's an opportunity out of that that people can tune in from the US who are interested in the digital construction sector and We'll get your Vico guys along to it. You know what I mean? It's it's all that. There's people who can come in who might necessarily have travelled to Dublin for the live event. We have this huge opportunity now to bring them all in digitally. So it's 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 exciting despite the challenges we're facing in in the short term around some of it. So um, okay. So I think just to probably wrap up, we're just about at the time. Maybe I think if each of you could maybe just give one quick fire answer as to think what do you think would be something that the people watching today could take away? What's the most important thing they can look to do with their business in terms of building that community going forward? What do you think is the most important point? From my side, I would say like authentic communication with, with our, you know, our community, that would be mine. Make sure you speak to them regularly, tell them what's going on and be honest and build an authentic kind of narrative. I don't know if each of you want to maybe give one takeaway. Yeah, my big takeaway is uh, you have to try harder. Uh, you have to work harder to connect and communicate. You cannot take it for granted just because somebody's behind a screen. So, so that's my takeaway to reinforce what Sarah is saying, that you really have to uh, make that extra effort right down to everybody in your organization internally and externally, not to take your customer for granted, communicate with them when you're not looking for something, that you care, that you connect, and you're part of that bigger community. So community is even stronger and more important. And it's also accelerating uh, what we have learned uh, from technology. So use this as an opportunity, is my view. Great, thanks, Emma. Um, from my perspective, I think it's that, um, it is that trying to use all of the channels that you can to communicate to clients or um, your customers. So from our perspective, like it's, you know, as, as Shane was touching on there, we've, we kind of people might have been questioning whether social media was right for their business right now it, it has never been more important i guess in terms of getting your message out there if you're doing any sort of um adaptations to your business let people know that your hours are changed um i noticed recently that google has automatically 
uh, but temporary clo temporarily closed on all businesses unless you adjusted. And I helped a client to change that because they're actually open during business hours. And just that little communication really helps them and they were really appreciative of that. But also old communications, I think with our own customers, our clients, people who have, you know, we've had working with us for so long with FFT, whether it's ads in the print edition or uh, running campaigns like Unilever Online, I find that I've never spoken to so many clients on the phone. And I suppose we all were very reliant on emails, but right now face-to-face -face is important or hearing someone's voice is important and realizing that we're all going through this together. Um, and I've spoken to so many clients about who, you know, people want to talk about their own situation and their own businesses situation as well as yours. And by sharing your own business, um, I suppose, stories that connects your businesses and forms a stronger relationship. So I would just say, use every channel of communication to ensure you're reaching all of your audiences and, uh, you know, make sure and share with them. Yeah, great. Thanks, Dee. Shane, if you want to wrap it up, I think you're muted there. Also, Bill Hill just commented, yeah, communicate, but be relevant. Yeah. Good addition as well. Yeah. Not too much more to add than that. Uh, maybe two thoughts. Um, uh, try to, in your communications around this time, try to uh, demonstrate empathy, you know? So it's a small thing like, how are you? Are your family okay? Like, it's just been incredible. The amount of people who you are business associates with, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and now you actually care about their wider lives. So try and infuse that through your communication. So that's quite a, we say, uh, an emotive type of, of, of writing that probably we're not used to in the business world. Um, so that's one thing. And the second thing is more a thought, uh, which is, uh, we've all said it, we've never seen such cohesion within our own organization, such, you know, alignment between previously uh, fighting at each other's throat silos and, and teams. Uh, all the small p politics in organizations seems to have been eroded for the moment and replaced with a capital P, which is pandemic, right? So, and we're all aligned and, I, and I've been getting on better with colleagues. Maybe this is a personal point about me, <laughs> but I'm getting on better, better with colleagues. But in, in terms of organization and efficiency, I've never seen anything like it in my career, you know? So, so the thought is, after the pandemic, whenever that may be, how do we maintain that kind of capital P momentum, we call it, how do we stimulate it as, as business leaders within our team and within our community? So obviously we wouldn't be using anything, anything close to anything as scary as a pandemic to do that, but what are the behaviors we're seeing now and the structures we're putting in place now that we should keep when the pandemic is over to keep this alignment and motivation and mo momentum going. And it's just something to watch out for. I don't, I don't know the answer, but I think it's watching what we're doing now and not forgetting it when things calm down a bit. Mm. Yeah, no, that's great, Shane. So um, I think we'll leave it there. So again, thanks to our guests today, Endo Canine, Shane Dempsey and Dee Laffin. Thanks to Paul, Laura and Diane for hosting us and all at BISHA and if you're looking to get involved um, visit BISHA.ie because it's a great organisation so we'll leave it there thanks very yeah. much thank, thank you, you.